Good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, inviting for me. And uh, it was a very uh, important uh, kind of opportunity for me uh, to uh, talk to you. Uh, I came here for Global Parliamentarians Forum that uh, was organized by the FAO and the uh, Spanish Parliament. So we had uh, two days meeting with all uh, parliamentarians and uh, basically um, Latin American countries and the African countries and the Middle Eastern countries, they sort of made a kind of uh, exchange of view uh, how to deal with the, uh, the current uh, issues of the food security and how to promote right to food uh, through the parliamentarians. As you know, parliamentarians are powerful if they really uh, work properly. Uh, so that would be an important uh, event. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you uh, about agroecology and the right to food, how uh, we'll uh, connect with two, uh, two concepts uh, and how important these two concepts should be uh, connected. Uh, before going to, uh, as already speakers mentioned, uh, state of food insecurity in 2018, there's a SOFI report by the FAO, uh, come with the alarming figures. Uh, this is a means uh, in undernourished people or let's say hungry people are increasing, increasing uh, to 821 million, which is 11% uh, um, more than a few years ago, which is a very bad news because uh, the global uh, policy has already mentioned 2030 of the sustainable development goals are um, uh, of targeting in 2030 eliminate elimination of the hunger and mal uh, reducing the malnutrition. This is, in my view, or in many people's view, is almost impossible because we have uh, almost 11 years to 2030. Time goes very fast, and instead of uh, increasing, uh, in, instead of de decreasing, the figures are increasing. As you know, there there is a uh, important uh, reasons why hunger and malnutrition is increasing. One of the major issues, we, we have a lot of conflicts in the world. The conflict zones are the most problematic zones, which is Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle Eastern countries. And some of them are actually in a level of starvation, which is important, which is the famine, which is crimes against humanity if this is a, a deliberate uh, a kind of act to avoid uh, people access to uh, food uh, and water. So we are not going this. There is a very serious kind of part of the uh, hunger and malnutrition. And uh, the, another issue is the climate change or extreme weather event. If you know, uh, extreme weather event is around the world everywhere. Uh, rich countries or poor countries, it doesn't matter, but the rich countries are able to uh, make uh, these uh, this, uh, problems less uh, serious for the people, but the developing countries, they, they are not able to handle to respond this. And the, of course, the most important thing is failure of the rural development because rural developments are basically how to handle the uh, hunger and malnutrition in the uh, rural areas. And these are the, basically the food producers in 78% in many parts of the developing countries. So problem of hunger is increasing. And then, as also mentioned, malnutrition becomes an important problem, not only under nutrition and the micronutrient deficiencies, the wasting and uh, stunting children, which generally we do look at this, but also overweight and obesity and the universal from developing countries to developed countries everywhere. And 1.5 billion people we are talking about, 700 million is ob obese, 
this rest is the overweight. For instance, if you look at the United States, it's the 45% of the population. That's a very serious figure. Same thing in Argentina, same thing in Brazil, same thing in almost becoming even China and Russia, that kind of uh, serious problem. So uh, this creates, of course, uh, diseases, what we call non-communicable diseases like diabetes, heart failure, and the, uh, something like that. So the, uh, why we have to deal with this? Because we have the problem of excessive food and supermarketization of our food system, which means we are eating really unhealthy food gradually in everywhere in the world. And uh, this is almost impossible to stop it. So uh, the, why we cannot stop it? Who control the food system? That's one of the major issues again that I mentioned. This is basically oligopolic system that we are talking about. The controlling the food system, not many, many big, uh, not many corporations, but actually small, but very powerful one. So if you look at the four companies, produce 60% of the world's seeds. And four firms account now 97 of poultry genetics research and de development. And the four uh, corporations produce more than 60% of the agrochemical that farmers use. But we talk about the six bigs. Now the six bigs companies become uh, three bigs because they are now merging. So why, uh, uh, how do deal with this uh, industrial uh, agricultural system? And why do we need the transformation, the food system that we are talking right now? The conventional food system need 10 kilocalorie to produce one kilocalorie, which is there's an energy problem. They use a lot of energy. And conventional agriculture produces more than 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions which is a very serious issue in relation to climate change. And erosion, land degradation, loss of biodiversity, water pollution, all the loss of vital resources is unfortunately uh, agriculture, uh, responsible of agricultural, uh, uh, industrial agriculture. So this figure shows this, how the industrial food system contributes to the climate crisis. Actually, it's not only we are talking about the production of the food, we are talking about uh, how the food is transforming or transporting all the way to our coming to, from farm to our table. So we have to look at much more a larger picture. There is a deforestation for the production. And there's a farming which used a lot of uh, oil uh, and the uh, 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 greenhouse gas emission energy. And then transportation around the world. For instance, one example that I keep giving all the time, in the United States, uh, uh, a poultry has produced there some kind of factory places that the um, animals never see in the sunlight and they never walk. And then these uh, uh, animals, this, uh, they, they transform to China for processing and cutting and packaging, and then it come back to the United States for our table. This is an unacceptable system. Of course, along this process, they use a lot of antibiotics to make the disease as less as possible. So if you look at the 60, 70% of the antibiotics that they were produced by the pharmaceutical companies goes to the animals. So when we eat our chicken, we don't need to have antibiotic because we get already from them. That's a very serious issue. Then of course, there is also a freezing system because they have to keep them cold, processing and packaging. It's a very, very serious uh, impact of the greenhouse gas emission if we really eat as we eat right now, which we are eating. So what we should do, how do we shift this uh, agroecological system? Uh, 
it said the good news that now agroecology is pronounced and is, uh, discussed and uh, sort of uh, trained a, a lot of countries. In 2009, there was a very good report. Uh, this, uh, uh, the name is very uh, kind of uh, uh, long. A fundamental policy shift in agricultural knowledge, science, and technology agri-food system. That's a very bad name, actually, for the report, but the report is very important. And uh, they make uh, how to make the change, how they use the uh, technology, institutions are important, capacity development, investment plan, and women's rights. Uh, these are all in the report, and FAO and 55 countries actually supported this report, including World Bank. But somehow, since 2009, the report uh, did not come to the mainstream. It, it stayed among the uh, hands of uh, NGOs, despite the best response to our hunger and malnutrition, best uh, response to climate change. So uh, we talk about the agroecology, we say seven pillars of agroecology, what are they? So uh, when we talk about the agroecology, we have to talk about this triangle, science, practice, and the social and political movement. Without this, one of these three is missing, it's very difficult to promote agroecology. So seven pillars of agroecology is gender equi uh, equity and women's rights soil conservation, water management, agrobiodiversity management, livelihood diversification, processing and market access, supporting farmers' organization. These are the major uh, kind of pillar when we talk about the uh, agroecology. So, uh, this is a picture actually I took when I was in uh, Zambia. And I visited a farm that uh, organized by a, a organization, uh, Kasizi Farm. It was a very uh, impressive system. Uh, they use a kind of local understanding with science and uh, social movement was of course important. They try to make to villagers uh, producing their own food from the uh, agroecological methods without the chemicals, of course. And uh, the, the, the villagers were telling me that they are making 10 times more than their husbands that they work in the big agro-industry. So it was a very important model that, that has to be really, uh, where did we go? So, uh, the, how from excessive use of resources and chemicals to push to the agroecology, to push to the people-oriented food production? These are uh, important questions that we have to really uh, answer it. And in this case, what are the benefits of agroecology? There is no repeating about the benefit of agroecology. First of all, we have to reduce the gender gap. The gender gap is everywhere. It's not only developing countries, it's not only Africa, it's not only South Asia, but it's everywhere because generally, traditionally, uh, farming uh, belongs to a man, but the workers are women. So the gender gap is important even in this country like Spain. So increasing employment and income is very serious because agricultural workers are the least, uh, uh, least protected workers, workers uh, sector in the world. We are talking about 1.3 billion people and they generally have very, very limited uh, salary if they have any. So agroecology agri will make the agricultural workers much more powerful. So actually we don't make the distinction farmers and workers, we talk about the agroecology. So uh, improving biodiversity, improving health and nutrition is important. As already said, uh, the soil uh, 
soil health is extremely important for the uh, better nutrient uh, uh, ingredients that we are having. So at the same time, of course, we are addressing the climate change, which is the very important. So uh, we, we generally talk about the climate smart in, in recent uh, uh, global public events because climate change is very important. Agriculture is very much connected with the, uh, in the climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. So the, the big time corporations come up with the climate smart agriculture and they said this is some kind of same agroecology. So you really have to be very careful the distinction between agroecology and the climate smart agriculture because they are are not actually the same, but they are trying to use the similar arguments, similar rhetoric, but agroecology, as you know, we need a very minimum input ecosystem use as opposed to increase outputs in climate smart. And local production is very important in agroecology, but industrial scale, they are not uh, uh, promoting local uh, local scale, basically uh, international. And the climate smart more goes to monoculture, agroecology is a diversified. And uh, agroecology prioritizes social, political, cultural impacts because it's not only about production, it's about ecology and it's about social protection. We have to make it all of them. So instead of machine intensive, we use labor intensive. Labor intensive is important because agroecology is a labor intensive production. Labor is needed and has to be paid properly. So we really have to understand getting a cheaper food is not going to help us for longer period. So as a consumer, we have to understand paying more to our food is not only helping to people but helping us in the very longer uh, period. So mm, there is a huge potential to eliminate hunger if we promote the local uh, agroecology rather than profit-oriented industrial agriculture. So what is to do with the right to food? So now I have to talk a little bit about the, let me see. Sorry about, okay. So what we, as I talked before, right to food is not a charity, which means uh, generally we see in Europe, especially food banks or soup kitchens that the poor people uh, get their food from there. This is not a right to food. Right to food requires the possibility uh, either to feed oneself directly uh, from productive land or other natural resources or to purchase the food. If we have a system that we are able to produce our own food in a reasonable and sustainable manner and the adequate food, quality and the quantity manner, and also if we don't produce, we have to have a system that we have a job that we can earn money, we can buy from uh, the uh, market. So, contribution to agroecology, to right to food. How are we gonna make them together? Uh, when we talk about the right to food, we have four concepts to make it right to food understood, what does that mean? Availability, accessibility, adequacy, and sustainability. Availability means basically uh, available food, which is production. Uh, Agroecology raises productivity. This is, of course, a very problematic sentence for, from the perspective of uh, per hectare per yield understanding. We are talking about more sustainable manner, more diversified, more, in, uh, more uh, vitamin and, and better quality food. So if we talk about it, industrial agriculture, obviously they are 
in short period, they are much more productive. They look like a much more productive, but in the long period, they are not actually. We have to look at more, uh, more, more larger picture. Accessibility it requires both physical and economic access. Reduction of poverty is definitely agroecology's way. And adequacy requires that food satisfy dietary needs, as we said, they have much more vitamin uh, and the, the more uh, quality ingredients, plus they don't use chemical, which is they don't make us sick, as uh, our speakers clearly mentioned, the importance of the uh, major uh, pesticide problems around the world, not only for consumers. Again, I'm talking about the workers. Workers are the most innocent victims of our food system because they get uh, they uh, more uh, exposed to pesticides than the consumers and their uh, health issues very problematic, especially in relation to their children and uh, also the whole family. A sustainability uh, measure, it is no-brainer. Uh, agriculture, uh, agroecology, adapting to climate change and use resources as little as possible because the whole idea was protecting of the resources while we are uh, producing our food. So we have, uh, the good news is we have a lot of global experiences around the world. If you look at the various kind of reports from NGOs, FAO, or other organizations, and my reports, because I generally travel everywhere, and I put all agroecology um, examples to my report, basically. So if you see a lot of uh, countries, from Argentina to Zambia, A to Z, we see a lot of uh, uh, methods and the uh, projects are going on. Uh, for instance, in Spain, Necasarea Network in the Basque country is very well known, very well uh, kind of exposed in our reports and other uh, reports. So that's an important uh, way. And uh, I learned that Minister of Ecological Transformation, this is a very good name uh, for a um, uh, new uh, ministry. I hope the other countries can get this similar idea to change Ministry of Ecological Transformation rather than Ministry of Environment. Of course, changing the name doesn't matter. Uh, it will be more institutional and political change. We have to understand they really do it or just the name or putting the window of shopping. So that's an important. The NGOs should really follow what will happen in the future in relation to good uh, policy names. So uh, public policies are very important as already uh, uh, speakers mentioned. First of all, we have to prioritize the public goods, which means water and land, all other resources, uh, productive resources, should be considered public good and should be protected as a public good. This also includes seeds. This is a very difficult and controversial sentence again, but we really have to uh, go bottom into this understanding that uh, the food production resources should be protected by the government and by the regulations. And knowledge investing is very important. Unfortunately, mostly uh, research and development money goes to big industrial agriculture, almost 99%. We are talking about 1% <coughs> knowledge in the agroecology. Social organizations should be strengthened, which means mm, farmer organizations should be supported. Gender empowering is one of the public policies. And access to market and uh, local production is extremely important. There is a problem also, <coughs> 
labeling issue, especially smallholder uh, producers, they are not uh, able to make the very complicated labeling rules and principles, especially in EU. Uh, when I was uh, in uh, Poland, actually, the uh, organic uh, uh, farmers that I visited, they were complaining about the rules and principles are so difficult. It is not possible for them to really register themselves as an organic farmer or the agroecological uh, uh, methods. So I think the regulators should understand uh, or should ease a little bit of this kind of regulations in order to make uh, uh, supporting uh, the farmers. So Europe is an important uh, continent, as we know, and as we know, in Europe there's no problem, always they talk about like that, and even in, when we talk about uh, the hunger, malnutrition, and food insecurity problem, we don't even talk about Europe. We don't even talk about the United States or UK. You think there is no problem in these places. Of course, there's a serious problems on these places. But in relation to agroecology, there's also a good way that because citizens are very much aware of what is going on in relation to their food, they are much more conscious about it. So in Europe, farmer to consumer, which means shortening the uh, chain, uh, production chain is very important. Farmer to farmer, farmer to consumer, community supported agriculture is a, uh, pretty much in a very good shape in, uh, in this country, in UK. Spain, of course, one of the major countries promoting agroecology. In Italy, a lot of uh, public institutions and schools are using procurement for the uh, local farmers. These are important uh, areas that we see in Europe, unlike the developing countries. So the farmer's market, grow, buy, eat local, these are very kind of good developments that is happening right now in Europe. So uh, what are the challenges we are talking about uh, the agroecology? If the agroecology is so good, why we are not going to practice agroecology altogether. So we need a political will for this. We have this one political bias that we really have to break this. The break of the myth about industrial agriculture will feed the world. So I, last year I did write a, a report about uh, uh, pesticides and the right to food. And when I wrote this uh, the report, I make clear that uh, pesticides are the major kind of ingredients to feed the world. This myth should be completely broken. If we can't break this, we are not going to go anywhere in agroecology. Subsidies to industrial agriculture in many parts of the world, especially in Europe and the United States, is a big problem. Half a trillion dollar in OECD countries plus, plus China, India, and Brazil. The huge amount of money go to the subsidies. How do we deal with the subsidies goes to the big industrial uh, farming? <coughs> and also, uh, 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 global trade rules are very much in favor of big time uh, industrial agriculture rather than uh, agroecology. Of course, agroecology is not going to be big global trade. It will be more local, locally oriented uh, uh, production. Lack of investment is important. Investment basically goes to the big time agriculture rather than a small uh, agroecology because uh, big time industrial investment is very lucrative, especially if we talk about the overseas investment. The big time uh, corporations, big time, even countries, sovereign countries, they go right now buy lands in outside of their country because they need it, they don't have a self-sufficiency, they try to make their citizens 
food secure. So land grabbing is becoming an important problem, especially in Africa and Latin America. So instead of supporting agroecology, basically we are uh, comp uh, competing with the big time land grabbing. Again, the research and development, only 1% goes to the agroecology. All these things are challenges and we have to really make these challenges uh, kind of uh, break all these uh, decisions uh, from the uh, politicians that we have to really make, educate them to understand the agroecology. Thank you.